and welcome to a Tuesday afternoons out to lunch here on WKCR FM in New York, 89.9 on your FM dial. It's three minutes after the hour of 12. Lauren Schoenberg here on a very special Tuesday afternoon edition, part six of the history of jazz drums with our special guest host, Mel Lewis. Mel, welcome back. Ah. Good morning, Lauren. <laughs> Good morning. It's always morning after Monday night at the Vanguard. Yeah. Well, that's right. It's so uh, we're we're still in the uh, wake of uh, <laughs> one of Mel's nights at the Vanguard, which yesterday actually I was with you. You, you were there from in the afternoon because they had the BMI yeah, presentation. Yeah, they had the BMI scene. So you really put in a, a full day and night. So more thanks to you for coming at this early musicians' oh, hour. It's always a pleasure to do this one. I love it. Well, today we're going to pick up right where we left off uh, with part six of the history of jazz drums. We're going to today delve into three drummers if we, get in, if we have time. If not, we'll get to as many as we can and just pick up next time. But we're planning to listen and talk about the contributions of Art Blakey, Tiny Khan, and Roy Haynes today on this afternoon's History of Jazz Drums, part six. But let's begin with another innovative drummer and some recordings that really... Uh, although he recorded with many great bands in the 50s, for some reason these recordings were very influential. And most drummers, when they one of the first records they think of when they think of uh, this drummer, are these recordings. And uh, we're talking about our guest Mel Lewis and a very special time as a member of the Terry Gibbs Band out in the West Coast in the late 50s. This is something called Just Plain Meyer. <laughs> Thank you. 
Oh, wow. Two tracks by Terry Gibbs, big band, in the early 19... Uh, pardon me, not the early 60s, but 1959. And we began with Just Plain Meyer, an original by Bob Brookmeyer, with solos by Terry Gibbs and Med Flory on the tenor. That's from the album on the contemporary label, Terry Gibbs' Dream Band, Flying Home. Yeah, it's volume three, I think it is. Yeah. And then the other one came from the album Just Dream Band, Terry Gibbs' Dream Band on Contemporary, and that was You Go to My Head, arranged by Bill Holman, with the arranger on tenor sax, Terry Gibbs' vibes, Stu Williamson trumpet, and, of course, our guest, Mel Lewis on the drums. What does it feel like hearing those 30 years Well, later? it was wild when I first heard them, when, uh, you know, when, they, when they first came out again, uh, I mean, recently, in the last uh, year and a half or two years. Uh, in fact, I just got the CDs, which I'm looking forward to listen to if my player ever gets fixed and uh i'm also looking forward to listening to my prokofiev and all my <laughs> other things that i that i haven't been able to hear but uh uh it, it was wild because you know these these particular tracks which uh, the, the wally hyder who just passed away was the engineer and these were made during his fun you know, just when he would do it for fun he'd just call you terry up and say oh, terry i want to uh, come down and record the band, you know, and of course he came down with his uh, portable unit with, you know, with the 15-inch reels and all that, and he had a, uh, his board was like uh, one foot long that oh, he man. built himself with just a few dials on it, and he was like the best big band recorder, I think, of all time, Yeah. and uh, especially for live recording, you couldn't beat him, you know, he got everything, it was a, just a few mics, and, and these were, uh, uh, I don't, I guess they're stereo, yeah, they sound stupid. Yeah, but uh, but just the way he did it, you know, I mean, was, was, was so he captured everything. There's no mics on the drums on these things. These are just into the into the mics. That's all. Whatever's there, and uh, and uh, I, I didn't realize how great these things really were until I to hear them all these years later. You know, and I mean, they are great. They're, there's no doubt about it. This is some of the best big band stuff that was ever made in history. Yeah, it's true. You know, and. Uh, and there's some wonderful players on that uh, that were there then. Al Persino, is, who back in those days was, I guess you'd say he and I were the team back then, coming off of the Kenton band and so on. And uh, and you have you know Joe Maney who's marvelous lead all the player who we lost you know, to for goofy reasons. And Charlie Kennedy who used to be with the old Gene Krupa band on you know disc jockey jump and things like that and. Of course, Bill Holman and Med Flory, who were both budding writers. At that, of course, Holman was a great writer already. Yeah. Okay. And uh, that was, you know, that was a marvelous band, and uh, a lot of Easterners, you know, who moved had moved to the West Coast. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, I, I don't think I ever played with a band that great until until my own. Okay. And actually, I think the band I have now every, is very much like that band was. We're playing much more complex music now, of course. Now yeah. times have changed over 30 years. But his spirit and uh, and 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 the love to playing, your love for playing. I mean, we have now. Uh, uh, th in other words, the band I, I I'm fronting now could play could have played this music with exactly that same kind of fire and, and yeah. hunger. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, there is a hunger. Yeah, there. there we have that now. We have that going. Uh, it's uh, we have. I think I got probably one of the best bands also in history right now, and uh, that was one of them also. You know, I mean, aside yeah. from the great Duke. Yeah. of the early 40s and of course the Basie band of the late 40s you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people you talk about what do you mean late 40s Basie band and late 30s, well the band yeah. with the, the band of the late 30s and, and and right into the 40s up to 48 if you think the band from 53 I mean that band with the with April in Paris and all that that was a marvelous slick band slick I say it was loaded with great players and it was big and heavy and wonderful to listen to, but man, we're talking about the band with Lester jazz, Young and, yeah. and, and, and Joe Jones. And yeah. That band, those were jazz, those were real jazz orchestras. It must have been something for you coming off of, uh, you know, being a, I shouldn't say a weightlifter, but playing with Stan Kenton's band and yeah. finally getting that band to swing. Yeah, well, and then playing lightening with the, it up and then yeah, playing with Playing this a band. band like this must have been playing with like a light batter. Sure, it's, 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 you know, it's, that's, that's yeah. the whole secret, you know, and that's yeah. why the old, that's why it's all about the old Basie band. Right. which also was light, light. you know. Yeah. See, point. the other band became heavy. I mean, it's a heavy sound, and, uh, of course, they had the hit records and the whole thing, you know, and, and of course, loaded with great musicians. Yeah. But uh, nowhere near the, uh, the the direction of the of the earlier bands of Basie, which were pure. And we're going to get into a lot of this stuff in greater detail as we continue with the history of the jazz drums and as we 
uh, do our Mel Lewis segments later on in the summer. Uh, we'll be getting into many, many more Mel Lewis recordings. Mel, I hope you'll forgive me. I'm going to take a detour now back to the... No, let's get into our... Back to our historical here. bag here. here. As we begin part six of the history of jazz drums with Mel Lewis, once again, you're tuned in to WKCR-FM in New York, 89.9 on your FM dial, 18 minutes after 12, and we turn now to... Uh, one of jazz's great drummers, Mr. Art Blakey. And we're going to begin listening to Art Blakey with the band that really brought him to national prominence, which was Billy Eckstein's great band of 1945. Uh, Blakey had played in Fletcher Henderson's band, actually, in Boston in 1942, but the band did not record commercially. And certainly this band was playing new music of the day, and uh, Art Blakey was right in there. We'll catch two titles where you can really hear Art well. These are Jubilee broadcasts, and we'll hear a few announcements from the inimitable Ernie Bubbles Whitman with some really <laughs> dated uh, announcements, but they're, they're period pieces. The band is anything but a period piece. It still sounds great. The tenors you'll hear are Bud Johnson and Gene Ammons, <laughs> and there are great trumpet solos on these tracks by Fats Navarro. But we're going to be focusing on Art Blakey, on the drums here with Billy Eckstein's band live on the air in early 1945. Yes, sir, yes, sir, send me that ballast from Dallas. I'm floating on a swoon beam. And now to keep the downbeat bouncing right along, here's a zootful, snootful called Mr. Chips, as it is fleeced and released by Billy Eckstein and his trilly tune tossers. Toss it, Billy, toss it. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service.
Ready and steady. Then start the beat and give us some heat. <laughs> Special arranged, yeah. arranged by Tad Damron, the Billy Eckstein band with Art Blakey on drums. Art Blakey's, you know, is always to this day, you know, he he, he loves big band, you know, and and, and he's actually patterned his uh, messengers, the six the six band group he's had all these years, uh, really after a big band. Everything's like he he emphasis is on ensemble playing. Yeah, of course, good soloing naturally, but the ensemble playing is very important. Art likes to play the figures, and you can hear that here. Now, this is 1945. Early 45, yeah. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You know, we were talking about Kenny Clark and all that, and, uh, and of course, Max uh, with the small group stuff. But in a big band, now, uh, the, what Kluke did with Dizzy uh, in 46, you know, when, when the, all those early bebop big band records came out, this is 45. Now, this, this is the pre-run. This, is the, this band was the pre-runner of, uh, of Dizzy's band anyway. And Art's doing a hell of a lot more. I mean, he's dropping bombs all over the place, offbeat stuff. Uh, he's catching a lot of figures with the bass drum, which, frankly, uh, I don't agree with. I mean, today, I wouldn't, I, w I wouldn't say that that was the best thing to do because he actually uh, could have done a lot of that up at, you know, using, utilizing the bass drum and the snare drum. It would have been uh, a little more, you know, highs and lows. You know, there's certain things you just shouldn't do 
with the base. But that was in those days where everything was still early anyway. Right. But you could see the control he had of the bass drum. That was not a great rhythm section he's playing with. He was the rhythm section. Thank God for him. He really made that band happen. Because the guitar was rushing. You could hear that when they ran into when they pulled the guitar up yeah. with uh, not a very Freddie Greeny sound, you know, which is, to me, the only sound you get in a guitar on a big band. And if you don't get that, forget it. And most guitar players don't get that, so forget it. And, uh, but... Art really had that same kind of fire he has today, you know. Yeah. I mean, he had it then. He's always had it. That's yeah. Art's one of the most, you know, they used to call, you know, they used to, you know, sort of savage yeah. style playing bull. That's crap. I mean, he was yeah. just, he's a happy, exuberant player. He ain't afraid. And he, he certainly wasn't afraid there. He was take, he was doing things that were very innovative for big band. Like what? Oh, it's just the way he played, uh, you know, he's playing very modern drums. I yeah. mean, you know, at a time when everything was just turning. Uh, things hadn't changed that much, but he was he was changing it. Yeah. And uh, see, the sad thing is that right after this period, there was a big, long recording band. And uh, and we would have got to probably hear a lot more from Max and from Kluke and from Art and, and, other, and, and other people. We lost it because of the stupid union, you know. And I mean, I don't mean stupid. James C. Petrillo, president, he wrecked our business, you know. With he wrecked the big bands with that, you know, just to get money for his Saturday night, the Saturday afternoon free concerts, you know. Actually, if people knew the truth, all the musicians know it. What? He wrecked the big bands. Petrillo was a jerk, How and he's well, he's he he asked for uh, this trust fund thing, which is still going on. And it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't put any money in any of the good musicians' pocket. It puts the it puts the bad musicians to work on Sunday afternoon playing at picnics. You know. How did that kill the big band? Uh, no recording, but the vocalists were all recording uh, with vocal backgrounds and and going over to Europe to get use studio orchestras over there and coming back with the records. You're saying that there was a connection between the recording band and this trust fund business. Yeah. Uh, the big band got bypassed by the singers. All of a sudden, the singers who were singing in bands right. became stars because they were making their own records. Prior to that, they were sa they would have been satisfied to uh, just be a singer in a band with a job, you know, and, yeah. and learn. Uh, but all of a sudden, Sinatra and Peggy Lee and Dick Hames and all these people who were band singers and the big band leaders were, you know, they were the stars. And all of a sudden, uh, the big bands had no records to sell your your recordings are your promotional items you know right even today i mean if i don't have a record out my band doesn't mean anything around the world you know we might be hot at the vanguard in new york but we still need those records yeah and uh to get the other work and right. and to be heard doing our thing you know i mean it's it's promotion same thing with small groups or any any kind of a musical organization kind of have a record see rock and roll without records wouldn't even exist you know, all these rock and roll groups, oh, we got to get a record contract before they even work a job, period. Yeah. And uh, luckily, they don't last long. But big bands do and did. And we missed a lot of that. So we don't know just how far people like, uh, I mean, Art was being very adventurous there. Now, who yeah. knows what he would have done, say, in 1947 and 48 yeah. when the record band went on. Yeah, I like the times when uh, he was really playing the Chinese symbol there. He was playing a Chinese symbol and All throughout uh, the solos. And yeah, which means makes me believe that that was his best ride symbol at the time. And uh, you know, did he use one in later years? No, uh -huh. but he went to the using K Zildjian symbols, and and he had that. He went for those uh, that deep trashy, as they call it, sound with the rivets and all that. Yeah. Uh, and that, apparently, because he loved his Chinese symbol so much. Yeah. And that Chinese symbol, maybe who knows what happened to it? It might have got stolen, or it might have broken. Was, those are in those days; those were real Chinese symbols, and they were very fragile, yeah. very, and they could break very easily. And uh, they're still the best sounding kind of Chinese symbol. I have several of them, you know. Yeah. In fact, Danny Gottlieb just brought me back a new one for a twenty-incher from Hong Kong, ah. which looks like it might be okay. And uh, and uh, but the whole idea of and all the good jazz drummers, which we noticed in those days, were using Chinese symbols, you know, for rides. Because I don't think the Zildjian its company hadn't really perfected good ride symbols yet. You know, they really were the the, the ride symbol 
as we know it today, was just coming in, the, the larger symbols. Before that right. was all, you had little symbols, crash symbols for color, and if you wrote on anything, it was a Chinese symbol. Yeah. You've been talking a lot in the past shows about the symbols in Zildjian and K-Zildjian and all these different uh, things, and I'm wondering if, if you could just go into a little uh, explanation of about the symbols the drummers used and, and and about the Zildjians, just about a, a, a little history of, of all that, because I noticed when I looked in the old uh, metronomes and downbeats, there's always been an ad in the 30s for Zildjian. They'd show Joe Jones or Dave Tuff or these mm -hmm. people up at, up in some far, Bo up in Boston up somewhere, in Boston, holding, yeah. a, Quincy Mass, yeah. holding a little symbol in their hand. Yeah. Could you tell us about Zildjian symbols? And well, see, the, 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 Z the Zildjian company actually started in Turkey, I mean, three, four hundred years ago. And... Uh, they made the original symbols they made originally were like what you'd call Chinese symbols today. I mean, they were they were Oriental symbols, and they were made. They were making symbols for the arm for the military, because symbols were used actually in battle to, uh, especially you know with the Turks, which is where yeah. this whole thing started was with the Turks and the, and the uh, and, and those that Middle Eastern area and uh, and uh, and uh, Persia, which yeah. is today Iran. There weren't many big bands over there at that. No, time. there was no big bands at all. <laughs> there weren't even little bands, but oh, the big bands of ga of uh, of uh, soldiers, you know. Right. They would use the symbols. Were used like in the middle of the night when a when a camp full of uh, soldiers were sleeping or something, and it was going to be an attack. The Turks uh, got this bit of uh, sneaking up in the dark, and uh, with, a, with maybe several hundred people, all of a sudden they'd start hitting these symbols together. Can you imagine the shock? And of course, this would panic the other, the uh, the enemy, and they'd come running out of their tents or wherever, the, in a total panic. They never heard this noise before. Sure. It scared them, and they started running the other way or running in the wrong direction and getting shot down. And that was a so that was a, a you know as opposed to today we have the bugle with charge. This was a whole different thing, and uh, that's what and Zildjian was make were making these things uh, for that purpose because there was, you know. Then later on, of course, they started making symbols which were used with the, in the symphony orchestras, you know, in Europe, which of course were everybody in Europe had. There was because symbols weren't used in the early symphonies. Right. There was no crashes and all that. But later on, Beethoven and uh, and Bach and people like that, Mozart, started uh, with the percussion thing because uh, they started using symbols. And of course, the percussionists had to get a hold of symbols. And Zildjian was the only one who could make them, so they. They started making them, and they had this special process of making a symbol, which is still used today to this day, which made their symbols better than anything. I mean, there was no competition then anyway. I mean, with better than what, you know, better than their own, you know. There was nobody else that made symbols, except the Chinese, who made Chinese symbols. But that stuff was brittle, and it was made another way, and it's a different kind of metal. So Zildjian started making the symbols out of copper and tin, uh, which makes bronze. In other words, their symbols right. are bronze. The symbols you see in here today are bronze, you know. Uh, and they were hand hammered, hand cut, hand ladled, you know, because we could only make a few at a time because in, a, in, a, in an oven it looked like a bakery oven, you know, in the old days making, sticking it into an open fire. Sure. And they just had the, the, the know how to make that. And of course, all the early symbols, which was known as the K Zildjian Company, I mean, it was the Karam or I'm not sure the first name. It wasn't the Veda Zildjian. It was Karam. Or, I think it was Karam. So the K Zildjian factory, was, or, which is still exists, was an old house, and these wonderful symbols were made, and each symbol was different. In Turkey? And, in Turkey. And they all had this, but they all, they had this oriental sound to them, uh, slightly, you know. What's and an oriental sound? Well, it's like a, it's, it's, it's like a Chinese symbol. And what's that? For folks who don't know what a Chinese symbol is, well, a Chinese symbol is a symbol that is uh, is got a like a it's like a gong, okay. in a way, you know. Well, except when it's made thin and is uh, played on, it, it gets a wang wang and ang dang and you know, you can hear it on all my records today yeah. if you ever hear that funny sound when you come yeah. coming out of. It's not a a, a high ringing. It's not sound. a high ringing sound. It's a low sound. And mm -hmm. Dizzy Gillespie thinks you know it's the biggest bass players too. It's the most complimentary sound for instruments. Yeah. But uh, some people don't like it because they think it sounds like a, like a garbage can. And in a way, it does, if you look at it that way. But to a, a, drummer, with, a drummer and an instrumentalist with discerning ears realize that 
This is a musical sound. Yeah, it's, it uh, doesn't compete with the no, highs. No, and it drives. It's got a driving. Yeah. It's, it's like a. It's ridiculous. If you, if you know how to play it and you know when to play it, that's the other thing. It's got a. It's got something that no other cymbal can have. So Blakey knew that obviously. In the old days, Shelly Mann knew it. Dave Tuft knew it. Sid Catlett knew it. Knew it. Cozy Cole knew it. And Dizzy certainly knew it. Dizzy made all of his drummers use Chinese cymbals all through his history because it makes his, it creates a brilliance in his trumpet, you know. Because yeah. Dizzy has more of a darker sound on trumpet. He's got a brilliant sound on trumpet. He's got that very special sound of Dizzy's. And the cymbal really makes it sparkle, yeah. you know, that kind of cymbal underneath it. And uh, because if, if a trumpet player, say like Harry James or, uh, or even Fats, you know, which has a, who has a more brilliant sound, uh, you need something high under him. You need something high under Miles because he's already playing in the low register all the time. Dizzy was always up there. Dizzy was really a, a great high note trumpet player. And, of course, that Chinese symbol gave him that underneath thing, you know. Yeah. And he used to park himself when I worked with him, and I noticed when he did with other drummers, when I worked with him, Dizzy always came over by the drums to play and, and cocked his left ear down to that cymbal. He wanted to really hear it in his ear. Yeah. And uh, and that was important to him, and uh, so that's the that's the Chi that's the difference between the Chinese symbol. Yeah, and then and, and then the and Kays then Zildjian moved to America in 1929, then and they started making symbols. They found a new process. At first, they were making them the same way as they were made in Turkey. So you're saying that the A Zildjian is the Americans and the K Zildjian is the Turkish? Well, Aveda Zildjian left his brother Karim, and he, he came over here, started his own factory, brought his sons with him opened up a place up in Quincy, Mass. They started making cymbals in the beginning, exactly the way they made them over there. And they were great. They were excellent cymbals in the beginning. Uh, and most of them, if you, you find old, old A's, what we call A's, they'll have that lower pitch sound because they were made that way. And, uh, of course, the K's already were, were lower pitch sound. And uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a sound, you know, that... Today, a, a good jazz drummer who wants that that beautiful bottom sound, you know, um, will look for a K. Of course, now the the company that's making them is called Istanbul, and they're but they've been forced by business, big business, rock and roll, rock and roll, make them heavy. Uh, I mean, they're wrecking them. They're just not making the same quality symbol they used to make. I was lucky because I've been playing K's most of my life. Uh, because thanks to Gretsch Company, who distributed them in America and all that, so I was able to acquire some very good K's, and I still have them. I got a couple stolen from me naturally, but uh, in in the city of New York, it's going to happen to you. But uh, whoever got them doesn't even know what they got. I'm sure because no drummer would do that to another drummer, but uh, not that I know of anyway. But uh, or maybe a rock drummer, uh, some young rock drumming kid, you know, who doesn't who can't go out and steal drums, you know. Because they used to do that. They used to. They, I'm not putting down rock drummers because that's not that isn't what I mean. I mean there were young kids who wanted to play rock. You know who couldn't afford a set of drums or they had a chance to steal something. You know kids will do that. I'm talking about kids. Have there ever been any other uh, cymbal companies that uh, filled in the uh, gap and uh, no? There's been cymbals? a lot of cymbal companies. Uh, now there's an awful lot of cymbal companies all over the world, and none hey, of them, Steve and all that. none of them can make a. I mean, they make cymbals that are good for modern day music, for the pop stuff, but none of them can do, can make what a K was. I mean, a, a good K is there's nothing better in the world, but you got to find them now. But I was lucky, like I said, when the Istanbul company took over. They're still made. Uh, they're still made the old way. They're handmade in Turkey. And until they got ordered by the new Gretsch company, who knows who know nothing about what a real great symbol is, they don't even know what a great drum is anymore. Actually, um, ordered them to make to, to make symbols for the market, which means make them heavier. So it's almost impossible in a way, unless you. A lot of guys are going, are getting over to Turkey, and when they get there, you can tell them what you want, and they'll make it for you right there. there you and they'll be glad to, because that's what they really want to do. But they got to make a living, you know. Yeah. In the meantime, the uh, Azildjian Company, which is everything is machine made today. The Istanbuls now are the only symbols that are still made the old way with the same old, they got the same old little fire in the, in the oven. <laughs> everything is hand cut, handmade, hand hammered. 
and hand spun on a, you know, I mean, it's great. And if you could find a good one, you really got something. And people like Blakey, were, their ears were so tuned to that sound that he went with the K's after that and has been playing them all. Now, I don't know what he's playing today. Somebody said Peisty. But he's looking always for the... Peisty is trying to copy the K. Uh, Evadis is have a symbol they call a K. That's no K, you know. But they put a big K on it. But they're also trying to copy that low pitch sound. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, but so once in a while you hear a good one. They do come through with a decent one every once in a while. But but basically, most of them are sound like machine-made junk, you know. And uh, I don't like them. But the Istanbuls I got when the company first started getting back in the, in the field here and it was being distributed in America, they made Jack D. Jeanette and I became their first advertisers. And they gave me my choice of cymbals. I found some beauties, which I'm playing now. Now I couldn't get symbols like that from them if I if I if I if I, if I you know they just don't they just uh, aren't making them. It's 12:44. You're listening to the history of jazz drums here on WKCR FM in New York, 89.9 on your FM dial. This is part six of a continuing series, heard on Tuesday afternoon sometimes and sometimes on the Musician Show Wednesday evening. And your guest host is the one only Mel Lewis. You're listening to WKCR FM in New York, 89.9 on your FM dial. It's 12:45 now, and uh, we're in the middle of talking about Art Blakey and picking up a lot of interesting information on the way from Mel Lewis. And right now, we're going to get back to Art Blakey, and we're going to jump from 1945, where we heard him with Billy Eckstein's big band, to 1956, and. Uh, totally different context, a piano trio. Mm -hmm. And we'll hear him with uh, someone who he's uh, always thought of as this as Thelonious Monk's, you know, as the drummer who was just perfect for him, not that the others weren't, but just a special, special relationship. Art Blakey on the drums, Thelonious Monk on piano, and Oscar Pettiford on the bass from the album The Unique Thelonious Monk. We'll hear Just You, Just Me. And again, we're focusing on the drums of Art Blakey. <laughs> Thank you. 